So, good evening. I, I, I'm Tim O'Shea. I'm the Principal and Vice-Chancellor of, of the University. Uh, tremendous uh, pleasure to welcome you to this Enlightenment Lecture, uh, which is the final lecture to top off a wonderful series of public lectures on our changing world, uh, which has been running uh, through the semester. Uh, the Changing World series has had distinguished academics from within the university who have discussed many of the global challenges that face society, including climate change, international development, population, infectious diseases, and global health, and the challenges and opportunities for medicine through advances in stem cell research. The lectures have highlighted the importance of interdisciplinary research and scholarship in meeting these challenges, and in particular, the excellent world-leading research in these areas taking place at this university. We, we've got a wonderful audience this evening, but the whole series has had a very good audience of 250 to 300 members of the public, students and staff. The important thing about the Changing World Lecture Series, apart from the content, is it's been the basis of a new interdisciplinary course for our first year students, which introduces them to the, these global challenges and the role of the university research in the global context. And this new course is part of the university's strategic aim to introduce sustainability and global awareness into our teaching. Um, it's, uh, university of Edinburgh is very old, more than 400 years old, very big, about five times the size of the average British university. It is extremely hard to do big new things. And it is an enormous credit uh, to professors Garris Leng and Mayank Ducha in the School of Biomedical Sciences that through their drive, uh, they have made this happen. So let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> but, but that was a queuing error because that was a round of applause for Gareth. <laughs> <laughs> So now I've got a wonderful prop. John, John is sitting in the seat that I usually sit in. Um, he, <laughs> he's the presenter, as, as you will all know, of Britain's award-winning uh, Channel 4 News. He joined the presenting team in April eight, 1989. He also presents First Edition, the weekly news and current affairs program aimed at 9 to 13-year-olds, and Weekly Planet, a late-night topical debate program. John joined ITN in 1976 after working in local radio and was made Washington correspondent in 84. He returned to the UK in 86, sp spending the following three years as ITN's diplomatic editor and reported on major stories all around the world. In 1995, John received the award for best male presenter from the Royal Television Society at their program and television awards. And he's won a great list of awards and I suggest you Google, because it would be an enormous... <laughs> I, could, I could read them all to you, but, but Googling would be simpler. Um, he's been a reporter in most of the world's trouble spots from Central and Latin America to the Middle East, Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and Russia. He's been the main anchor for Channel 4 News since 89 <clears throat> and reported the free, freeing of Nelson Mandela, uh, the downing of the Berlin Wall, and many other important world events. He's made several documentary films and chaired uh, many television debates and discussions about matters arising, ranging from GM foods to religious persecution. In addition to presenting programs on Channel 4, John is chairman of the New Horizon Youth Center and deputy chairman of the Media Trust. Uh, he's been tremendously generous uh, in coming to give this important lecture to you, but also today tremendously generous uh, in his interactions with our students. So I'm absolutely delighted to present him speaking to you on the topic, a changing media in a changing world. <laughs> Well, Principal, uh, thank you very much indeed for that kind welcome. I'm very daunted to be here. I've never seen so many live people that I actually have, I actually have to speak to. Um, you might think that if you pitch up on television every night that it would be a doddle because, you know, you're talking perhaps to a million people, but um, you're never aware of it. There's just you 
and two or three other people in the studio, and you're talking to the camera, which is, you just think of it as sort of one person, and you're going on a journey with that person, and the journey is going to be the day's events, and we're in it together. But here, this is, this is, this is terrifying. Um, <laughs> I mean, they sent me a blurb about what I was in for, and they said, we, 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 we probably expect two or 300 people. That, that sounded reasonably manageable. And then they sent me a thing the other day saying, we've moved the venue, which has a capacity of 1,200 people. And, uh, well, I, I thought about cancellation, but uh, um, there we are. Then they promised me a lunch with 24 students, and that field felt really uh, manageable, and it did prove to be so. It was really enjoyable. But I really am delighted to be here because I'm sort of by adoption uh, sort of related to Edinburgh University. My wife uh, was tutored to her first class honours degree in neuroscience by Professor Gareth Leng. And he, as you know, is one of the two moving spirits behind this lecture series. I won't embarrass him by saying how wonderful she thinks he is. Uh, but I do want to thank him and I want to thank Professor Mayank Dutia, who with Gareth has created this wonderfully eclectic a grouping of lectures and lecturers. Um, and he also sort of boxed and coxed to make it possible for me uh, to contribute because I could only come on a Friday. And I thought if I offered a Friday, no one would turn up because who turns up to a lecture on a Friday? Um, we're all very sad people. <laughs> <laughs> um, my um, offering to you tonight, I mean, I've got to say, I'm not an academic and I'm, I'm not an intellectual either. Uh, I'm a, you know, a jobbing hack. And, um, but, but I want, I'm also actually an optimist too, and I have to warn you of that. Um, but but the, the subject of the lecture, changing media in a changing world, um, I want to sort of just bring home to us all, me included. Uh, I found even thinking about this lecture uh, a kind of salutary thing because the pace of change in the world I operate in and the world we all consume uh, has been absolutely unbelievable. To have had a working lifespan that bridges silent film, I'm going to tell you, right up to the completely digital age and instant Twitter and the rest of it is absolutely shocking, shocking, and uplifting and concerning and a challenge. Um, my first month as a reporter in at ITN was in 1976, and it was Harold Wilson's last month. Uh, and we would go to Downing Street, as I say, armed with a cameraman who had a silent bell and howl wind up camera. Now that wasn't the state of the development of cameras, but it was, such was the culture that it was thought in those days that all you needed to do really was to send a camera that had about a minute's time in it, just for the moment when the Prime Minister comes out of number 10 into his car, burns a hole in his jacket with his ill-extinguished pipe, and goes off to the commons. And, that I, and the sort of cub reporters were sent to see if he fell over on the doorstep or something, you know, nothing more than that. And of course, don't forget that in 1976, there were no Thatcher gates. Anybody could be outside Downing Street. There was no security threat. There was the two jolly policemen either side of the doorstep. But there was no guns, there were no, no security of any description. And, you know, so you would be there just to see the public intersect with the, with the Prime Minister, and they'd dub some sound on afterwards. So there you were with your minute of time, the man had wound up the camera, out comes Harold, off goes the car, and that's it. That's 1976. The film would then be sent back on a motorbike to ITN where it would be bathed for two or three hours and that night sometime it would actually pitch up on the television. I mean, contrast that with today, you know, where you have absolutely instant coverage. I'm going to talk to you a little bit later about how it was to be on the night that Brown resigned, not knowing whether we'd got a Liberal Democrat um, Labour or Liberal Democrat Tory deal, what was to be the future, something completely unknown. Um, the contrasts are extraordinary. Uh, but I'm also going to, this is a field in which we don't look to technology for anything. Technology for us has arrived. It need do no more, but of course it will do a great deal more. Um, the human is in trouble. The human is so far behind the technology that uh, that is what I want to look at. But I am an optimist, and I'm absolutely certain that if we can get it right, we're on the threshold of a golden age of journalism, a golden age of information sharing, of democracy too. Um, so that's the sort of pitch I'm going to try and 
make to you. Um, I was sent down to Downing Street to see Wilson go and Callahan arrive. This time we had it on an actual live camera, which was very large, and was recording it onto two-inch tape. Uh, not, not, or not even the cassettes we're familiar with, but two-inch tape on spools that were so heavy it took two men to move them from one to the other, and the, uh, you could actually cut them with a razor blade diagonally, which in some way cut the sound and the picture in such a way that it was in sync. And it was an extraordinary thing. Um, my first live transmission was in 1977, when Carter, President Carter, came over to see Callahan at Lancaster House. And uh, in those days, um, people were very wary of the live camera. And the authorities said that we couldn't have a live camera. Uh, it happened that Wilson and uh, that Callahan and Carter were going to appear at some point during the tea time news at 5.45. So I got in as a technician. Um, I was so unknown, which was a very nice condition to be, that uh, I could pretend that I was in some way familiar with the workings of, of the camera and the rest of it. And I went in with the cameraman and was wired up with headphones and the rest of it, just so it made it look as if I was actually in some way functional. And I'd had a tip from the Prime Minister's man that Carter and he would come out uh, uh, just at the beginning of the news. So, of course, they crossed to me and I said, hello, here I am standing outside Lancaster House waiting for them to come out, and they, of course they didn't come out. And then at the end of the program, I got word that uh, they still weren't going to come out, but, the, but the, the, because they'd invested so much in having a live camera, it was now two minutes to six. The news finishes at six. And uh, the, so they said, we're going to come back to you anyway, John. And just after they came back, the cameraman started going like this. And I thought, do I look at the camera or shall I look around? So I did look around. There they were, right there. And I shouted to the, to the president, Mr. Car Mr. President, you're live on British television, as if that would be an exciting experience. <laughs> <laughs> but in those days, it was an exciting experience. And he walked straight over. Well, it was now 45 seconds to the end of the news bulletin. And in those days, um, ITV, which is what I was working for, um, had regional stations, Scottish television and all the rest of it, Grampian, uh, Tyne Tees, etc. And there was a junction at 6 o'clock. And at that point, Yorkshire television would pull the plug. And that meant everybody north of Yorkshire would lose whatever we were doing. So you had to be finished by then. And anyway, uh, at that moment, there had to be, somebody had to make a decision. Shall we pull the plug or not? So I just got the first question out to the President of the United States. And the engineers had to decide whether to pull the plug or not. This was not a situation either I or the editor had ever confronted before. Um, but at any rate, they didn't uh, pull the plug, uh, except for um, uh, Southern Television, and um, they did pull the plug. But the rest of them all, all stayed on, and we, we stayed on till about 10 past 6. And it was incredibly exciting. It was something you just didn't ever do. We had broken all the sort of surly bonds and the rest of it. And I got back to the, uh, to, to, to the office, and, and they were thrilled. There was no question about that. That was all right. But there was a very angry man from Channel Television, on the man who did the Channel Islands. He said, you have wrecked our entire evening's transmissions. We have no way of catching up. We're now running 15 minutes behind on absolutely everything. Even Coronation Street can't go out at its usual time. This became much more important than the fact that we got this amazing scoop of a live, unique interview with the President of the United States. What he said, I have absolutely no idea, of course. Um, <laughs> That was at home, but abroad, we were still absolutely miles from any video. There was no question of any video ever going abroad. In 1977, I was sent to go and chase Idi Amin, who was already a real serious gangster, tyrant, and, and killer of his own people. Um, now, I mean, a foreign story was extraordinary, because you would be dispatched, and you would go for many, many weeks. It wasn't worth bringing you back. There were no live transmissions, so it was awfully cheap. All you had to do was somehow get the film, film, back to Britain. And you would either do that by blagging a passenger. Just imagine somebody coming up to you with a suspicious looking bag, uh, <laughs> rather heavy, with two or three great tins of film, and say, could you take that to London? No, don't open the tins, you'll expose it. You know? <laughs> so so uh, they, they, you, would, you would say, listen, I, $100? Oh, of course, $100, of course, I'll take it, yes. Uh, or you'd ask the captain, or you'd have to ship it in the hold. But if you shipped it in the hold, it could take days to get it out of Heathrow, and then you had to pay money to get that out as well. So uh, you were shipping film in those days. So you would be sent out. Um, I remember the first time I went out going for about six weeks, and perhaps 
uh, shooting about 26 stories. I mean, lots of them. You just send them back. And you had virtually no relationship with your news desk at all. We could only talk to them on telexes. The telex, there's nobody here old enough to know what a telex is, but oh, yeah, the principal has just put his hand up. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, you, 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 here you would sit at a, uh, what looked a bit like a typewriter, and you'd be punching holes in a tape. And amazingly, this tape, which fed very, very slowly through, would, would arrive in London in the form of letters on a piece of paper, uh, which said what you wanted to say. But you had to have your conversations, and they were frustratingly long and slow. But, but you could say, I am in Uganda proposing story on Amin murdering people, and that would be it. And, and the, you would say that they'd just say, yes, carry on, and then you would carry on. Well, the, you've got to contrast that with today, because one of the arguments I'm going to make is that we're in a sort of sausage machine era in which television um, news has become much more formulaic. And what has happened is that the center that we were out of control of uh, has taken control and is now kind of describing what we have to do. Could you please go to Uganda, do a quick interview with Mr. Amin, do a piece to camera on the Ginger Dam, and then please, uh, we'd like a few Vox Pops from Ordinary Mortals, and then that would be it. You're just told what to do. Whereas we were cast off as reporters, and we just had to go and find out what on earth was going on. And that is the essence, in the end, of retrieving information. And that's the beauty, for example, as I will again mention later, of going to Haiti. Um, and actually, not the whole thing, in a sense, uh, being so difficult that actually you have to retreat to what you used to do, which was to go and find out what's going on, instead of listening to somebody sitting on a cosy news desk somewhere to tell you, telling you what's going on. I've just seen on CBS. I've just seen on CNN. You must get a picture of that chap with the woolly hat because he's awfully articulate. No, I'm somewhere else. I'm just going to do what I have to do. Um, anyway, um, I would just give you a quick aside. The thing about being a foreign correspondent at that time was that because there was no live transmission, you had much greater freedom to try and actually get to the truth of what was going on and to spend time doing it. And I remember Idi Amin saying to us, I would like you to come and visit my village uh, in the West Nile, a place very few people ever went. And to spend a whole day with a tyrant and dictator, killer, etc., was clearly you know, going to be a very interesting experience. Um, so he said he was going to fly us there in his presidential jet, uh, you know, wasn't it amazing? You would find a Falcon jet sitting on the tarmac, which some benign government somewhere had given him. And um, so there we were uh, in the presidential jet, sitting, waiting for him. Very, those of you who do travel extensively in this manner will know that they're very tight, confined spaces, these, uh, these executive jets. And there were just two seats, uh, two rows of seats, one either side, and a very narrow uh, corridor. And I was sitting here, and my cameraman was in front of me, and there was a very burly uh, air hostess behind me, and a Swiss pilot. And then the whole of this side was empty. And then suddenly all the light drained from the plane, and we were aware that the vast figure of Amin had now come into the plane. And he sat down right there next to me. Uh, Amin, every time you saw him, was wearing a different fatigue. Uh, on this occasion, it was a Texas Border Rangers uniform with a Stetson. But on many other occasions, I found him wearing a Stuart tartan, a full fig, uh, you know, kilt, sporran, the lot, very large knees. Um, and, um, but on this occasion, he was dressed as a Texan ranger. And very soon after we took off, uh, the, the, the Stetson fell forward over his head, and I became aware that he was asleep. And I looked down, and there was hanging between us a pistol, hanging out of his sort of thing there, right between us. And it was one of these awful moments when I thought, should I shoot him? <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's a serious challenge. Um, I, I mean, what are you there for? Are you there to save humanity from a vicious tyrant, or are you there to report the facts? Well, the fact was he appeared to me to be asleep, and he had a, what appeared to be a loaded pistol in his, in his holster. Um, and then. Of course, I know this is a largely scientific audience. I thought about the science involved. What does happen if you fire a high-velocity bullet uh, into a very fat man in a confined pressurized space? <laughs> does it ricochet around inside the vast girth, 
or does it go right through, through the fuselage, pssst, and do you become the size of a pea and go out after it? Um, this I didn't know, because I never was very good at science the first time, and I now see a very perplexed uh, grimace on the principal's face. It's clear, clear that doesn't happen. But anyway, I was, I was stupid enough to think it might, um, or wise enough, who knows. But at any rate, and then, um, I, 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 of course, then you ask, is the gun loaded? Is he actually asleep even? You know, you go, ah, and he goes, ah, gotcha, you know. <laughs> Uh, and then what would the Swiss pilot do? You know, all these things. Well, I'm only telling you this because, partly because I feel a sense of responsibility for the fact that I mean, died a quiet death beside a swimming pool in Jeddah a mere four or five years ago, and that's largely my fault. I mean, I could have, could have saved humanity an awful lot, um, but I flunked it. Uh, but but in, in truth, I only tell you that because there was the time to do something rather strange, which was to spend a whole day with a tyrant going up to his village and coming back again. Um, but, but in that time, I learned a great deal. I mean, I learned a lot about how people intersected with him, what it was that still kept him going, um, how he got away with the way he was, and also the fact that he was a very, very moody guy who could move between charm and uh, humor and really vicious bad temper and, and something very threatening and violent. Um, and all those things I wouldn't have had the time to do today because somebody would have wanted me live at six o'clock. So I'd have had to say, I'm awfully sorry, we can't come with you because I've got to do a live insert at six o'clock. That is not the lot of a Channel 4 uh, correspondent because we're on at seven, but I'm really talking about the, the vast majority of journalists that are sent for television to go and do things. They are constantly besieged by the requirement to be live to be instant, to prove that it's possible to be standing on the banks of the Nile and speaking live to you. There's something uh, that a lot of people in television think is incredibly important about that. I don't happen to think it is very important, but there it is. Um, you then move forward to 1979. I'm just going to give you a sort of crude account of where we are just to give this, uh, this idea. You're still on film in the, in the Iranian uh, revolution. Uh, which was an absolutely unbelievable experience. I mean, millions of people in the streets and, and a place that had had such a Western order about it suddenly completely turned upside down. And there was something extraordinarily exhilarating about it as well. And something very nasty because as you wandered around, you saw how the regime that had gone before had held the populace down, a lot of torture, a lot of... Uh, extraction of fingernails and all sorts of stuff which became extremely clear at that moment um, and uh, but again it you reported the revolution maybe two days after it had happened and people were happy with that because they got a reasonably full account of what had actually happened and they were a little wiser about the nature of what had happened uh, we couldn't do it instantly there wasn't a chance um, and uh, I don't know there was something uh, about the way in which you experienced this whole thing without having to interrupt to go and do live this or that, uh, that educated you about what was actually going on. You were in a better position to tell people what was going on. Again, 1979, Mrs. Thatcher arrives in Downing Street. Uh, there again, we are now live on, 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 on big two-inch video. Nothing has happened. There's not been any great, uh, great scientific breakthrough for television. Mrs. Thatcher, still no security. Me now standing on the Downing Street doorstep, Mrs. Thatcher in front of me, looking at the people across the road and the cameras, and I'm somehow wedged between the iron railing that was then at the side and um, uh, the policeman. And I look over her shoulder, and I can see a piece of paper, tiny postage stamp. She's declaiming the prayer from St. Francis of Assisi. Where there is doubt, let there be faith. Where there's despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. And of course, the impression on television was, isn't that lyrical? She's got it all, she knows it, but she hadn't. She got in her hand this little postage stamp, which only I could see. <laughs> and uh, I could see, you know, uh, darkness, light, sadness, joy. It's all there in, in this little postage stamp, in her handwriting. And uh, here's an amazing thing. I wrote about it in a book. And the other day, I was at some frightfully erudite setup, and the librarian from Churchill College, Cambridge, came up to me and he said, you've solved a problem. W years ago, when we got the Thatcher Papers, this little postage stamp fell out, and it had sadness, joy, 
Darkness, light, and it's in her handwriting. We just couldn't work out what on earth it was. And now we know. <laughs> um, but again, you know, we had the space uh, to think about it. Well, now I want to fast forward to the present. I want to fast forward to 18 minutes past seven uh, on the day that Gordon Brown resigned as prime minister. We went to air at seven o'clock with no clue that it was going to happen. At about 15 minutes past seven, uh, blessed with the company of John Prescott and somebody else, I can't remember, the other person was completely eclipsed by this quite extraordinary character. Um, what an odd experience it was. Here he was, anyway. So I had him and I had somebody else. And um, so we, we were covered. I was down in Westminster, we were on the green. Everybody was very excited, but we did not know that he was going to resign. And then I got word through my earpiece um, people talk to you the whole time when you're doing the news, and very often you ignore it. But on this occasion, it seemed rather important to accept it. They said, Brown is leaving the door. He's getting into the car. And at that moment, there were helicopters up, there were police cars, sirens, everything else. And I could see the pictures down on my little monitor here. And the helicopter was showing a top shot of the car coming down Downing Street. Now, I, of course, at this stage, we did not know he was going to resign. It was not clear what was going on. Was he going to go and see the Labour Party to tell them he was trying to sell a deal with the Liberal Democrats, or was he going to go to the palace to say he was off? It wasn't clear. I thought, as a cyclist, I'd worked out in my head, I'm now cycling in front of the car, uh, and if he turns left, uh, then he'll go up to uh, Trafalgar Square, he'll turn left, go through the uh, archway, down the mall, and it'd be a lovely sort of prime ministerial possession, and we'll know that it's the end. But he didn't. He turned right. And I thought, crumbs, that's the Labour Party's down there. He must be going to go and brief them. But then he went round Parliament Square and down Burge Cage Walk. And this is where I'm on this journey with the viewer. We are both as ignorant as each other. We've just got to be honest about it. We don't know the hell what's happening. Is he really going to resign or isn't he? And at that moment, it's one of the most exciting moments because you are discovering at exactly the same time as the viewer as to whether he is or he isn't. The best thing is you haven't actually committed yourself one way or the other, but neither is the viewer. None of us know. Will he resign? And he's on in Burge Cage Walk, then you know he's going to because he's not going to go and visit the barracks at the bottom. He's going to turn right and go into the palace. So uh, all this is going through one's head. And meanwhile, you've got old Prescott sitting here. And I find myself suddenly confronted with looking at a close-up picture of a Jaguar with a prime minister in it. And I turn to Prescott and I say, ah, Mr. Prescott, yes, well, let's, let's, let's talk about where he's sitting in this Jag. Of course, you know a thing or two about Jags, don't you? <laughs> I thought that shouldn't have come out, but it was actually fun at the time. Um, but, but the point is, who put those helicopters up? Who provided 27 different camera positions on the route? Was it Google? Was it Yahoo? Was it a Twitter? Was it Facebook? It was good old conventional, old-fashioned television that brought you Idi Amin on film, the Iranian Revolution, the Iran-Iraq War, the freedom of Mandela. This was content. This was content. This was the viewer finding out with you in real time what was actually happening, and we were just about to experience something nobody in this room has ever experienced before. The birth, whether you voted for it or not, of a majority government for the first time in our lives. The first time that a government was taking power with a majority of the votes. Not 36%, but 51% of the votes. Now, you may say, well, we didn't actually vote for X or Y in order for them to get together and do this. It doesn't matter. The point is that they represent the votes of the majority, and that's never happened before in our lifetime. And that's an extraordinary thing. No, Mrs. Thatcher didn't have it. Harold Wilson didn't have it. And Tony Blair, of course, when uh, six out of ten people voted for somebody other than the Labour Party, had six out of ten of all parliamentary seats. That's a thing to think about. But there you are. It was a minority government uh, in terms of votes with a huge majority in Parliament of 60 seats. It's very, very interesting. And so here we were in completely new territory. Uh, coalition, yes, that was also completely new territory. But what really struck me was that they had so many votes. They actually had so many of the people's votes. Whether they deserted what it was the votes, uh, voters had voted for, it is, doesn't matter. Fact is, the people in there had been elected by a majority of people. So this 
moment was not brought to you by new, to new media, was not brought to you, well, it may have been the conduit, but it didn't generate it. It was generated by old-fashioned media. And the new media is never going to put a helicopter up. New media is never going to provide a camera anywhere unless it's to spy on your street corner to put on Google Maps. Uh, the, 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 this, this is an interesting situation. But putting those helicopters up cost us a lot of money. Putting those cameras out cost us a lot of money. Google, Yahoo, Twitter, Facebook, Yahoo, um, uh, YouTube, whatever. They, of course, had a field day because all these pictures pitched up on all those, all those platforms. Uh, did we get a penny? Not a single penny. Not even for the jet fuel. Nothing. Nothing at all. So here we are in an absolutely fascinating situation in which we are generating content. We've still got quite a lot of people watching us in the way they always have. But there are at least as many people constantly visiting and revisiting, and not even in the United Kingdom, all over the world, visiting this material on other platforms for which not a penny has been paid. Well, this is the point at which I would like to talk about a documentary, a documentary called Man on Wire, because this is a great allegory. I don't know whether anybody has seen, I imagine people have seen Man on Wire, I regard Man on Wire as one of the totemic documentaries of our time. It's about a completely mad French tightrope walker who hatches this idea in the middle of the French countryside that he wishes to walk the tightrope between the Twin Towers, when, of course, they were still standing. He's never been to New York. He's never seen the Twin Towers. He has no idea how he's going to get the tightrope into the building, let alone across to the other building. But the amazing thing is he does it. Somehow he defies the security. They have no idea how to get the wire across. And they're so absent-minded, they didn't even take a movie camera to film him going across. They took lots of stills, and you see him with his head on, on the tightrope, with one foot on the tightrope, uh, spread-eagled on the tightrope, asleep on the tightrope, but you never actually see him walking across. But it doesn't matter, because you leave the documentary completely certain that he did it, and he did do it. Um, now, what's the allegory here? You have these twin towers, and in one tower, there is the Google, there is the Yahoo, there is the Facebook, there is the Twitter, there is all the new technology, all the new media. And in the other tower is us. We content providers, we hacks, we producers, we people of great excellence, we people who, who, who go out and hunt for information and who... Who, who, who hone it into a product that is consumable. Well, we don't at the moment have a tightrope, but we are in the tower and we're well up it and we know how to get out onto the roof. And we know a person or two who may be able to put a tightrope together and we know a person or two who may be able to throw it across. And so the allegory is really in a sense that they need us, those guys in the other tower, they need us as much as we need them. They can't really sustain new media without some quality content. When the internet was first, uh, was first invented, the word that defined what everybody said would be the test would be content, content, content. It's all very well reading a tweet that says, have got up feeling drunk. Now, we all know people who get up feeling drunk. And sometimes we've got up feeling drunk. We've not often wanted to share the fact with the World Wide Web. But the fact is that there is plenty of that. And for people who are on Facebook or indeed have, a, uh, have, a, have followers who are part family, part friends, and the rest of it, uh, it can be fun to say you've got up feeling drunk. But that's not going to sustain the world. The fact is uh, people want to know more than that. They want to know what's going on around them. And if something happens, like a vast flood in their neighborhood, they want to know why and they want to know what's being done about it. And that's where more has to come in, because Twitter isn't going to put a helicopter up over Boscastle or over Newton Abbott or anywhere else, or Cumbria a year ago today, Cornwall now. Nobody's going to... Actually, I mean, you know, getting to Cornwall is almost as impenetrable as getting to Haiti. Uh, it, it really was a big challenge getting people down there. Um, you only discover that when you need to go quickly. And uh, uh, th this, this is where... The, now, it's all very well, yes, 
uh, Mrs. Blenkinsop living at number five in Newton Abbott is able perhaps uh, to phone in a little something or pops, perhaps even take a photograph and, and email it or maybe even take a bit of movie on her camera and email it. But she's a resident and whilst one wants to hear from the resident, you need somebody who's going to reflect the resident, the meteorologist, bring together a holistic account of what has actually happened because people want to know quickly what this story really is. They're not really patient enough to listen to all the residents of Newton Abbott uh, piecing together what it is they think has actually happened to their town. Uh, that, that isn't how life works. We, we, we need, even you academics, need some conciseness about what's available in terms of information. Um, so we are needed, and we will prevail. I mean, the advertising industry has picked up, so to, for a moment, television has another breath of life, but we will have to find a deal somehow that enables us to cross the uh, tightrope and enter the other tower and make music together. Now, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm nearly there. I'm very conscious that we're, I've been wittering on a bit. Um, then we have to talk about the other platforms and the fact that we also operate on them. Blogs, citizen journalism, uh, Facebook, Twitter, and, and, and the way we use it. I mean, I thought, even if you'd asked me to give this lecture a year ago, I would have said that I felt enormously threatened by new media, by the cyber revolution. I would have admitted to it. I thought that the new media, the new platforms, were going to bleed television. But actually, I understand how they are now feeding television. If you just go to the Channel 4 News website, if you don't want to watch an hour, and who does? If you want to go and watch... Uh, if, you, if you just go to the website, you will see a cascade of pictorial uh, hints as to stories that have been transmitted that day. And you may see Haiti, you may see Moscow, you may see Ireland, and you may see um, cricket, whatever it is. And there will be two or three things you want to see. And you'll hit them and you'll watch. And that's courtesy of the World Wide Web, without a doubt. Um, and, and that's performing a function. Um, Twitter. I am a complete devotee of Twitter. I believe Twitter is, we have arrived somewhere. Because of our capacity to shrink web addresses by just going and processing them through BitLink so easily, shrinking them down to eight or ten characters, suddenly within our 140 characters that we can have on Twitter, we have the capacity to send a link, which people would just hit and see whatever it is you want them to look at. And you can, you can lead people to water. It's a fantastic thing. You can say, I, I mean, I, I did this morning. You know, I, 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 I said I've just read a very interesting thing uh, in the FT. I recommend this, and there's the link, and boom, off it goes. And I mean, I've only been on Twitter for about three, five months, I think, and I have, I think, 28,000 followers. Now, that's not very many. Stephen Fry has over a million. Uh, but he does say awfully banal things on his... Um, <laughs> but, but you can see where we're going. We can begin now to build a kind of relationships with, with people. I mean, you know, when I first started transmitting reports, I would get the very occasional letter in green ink underlined in red with a complaint, and that would be it. There might be a few phone calls to the switchboard. But fundamentally, there was no relationship with the viewer, the reader, the consumer at all. Now there's the most sensational relationship. This is why I believe we're going into a golden age, because suddenly the media is becoming democratized. Whatever Murdoch or anybody else wants to do, the fact is there's a people force in play. And the people force is one which responds, which is constantly feeding back, either by email, by Twitter. I mean, the Twitter traffic that I have Every day is, and you may think, well, God, what time have you got to read this stuff? Amazingly, with Twitter, you read it incredibly fast. You can consume about 100 tweets in about five minutes and answer them all in another five minutes because you pick out about six that need answering, and, that's about, and that answers a lot because there's a lot of commonalities and the rest of it. But it's a relationship. People have the right at last to say, I think what you've just said is absolute rubbish, and this is why. X, Y, Z, and they lead you to a link that has a particularly, last night somebody said, we, we transmitted a story about the Channel Islands and about how in fact they weren't all Quislings, quite a lot of them were rather heroic uh, resistors when the Germans took over in the Second World War. 
somebody sent me an email saying, this material was not discovered yesterday in a, black, in a, in a briefcase in a chimney breast. It's been in queue at the public records office for the last 15 years. Well, they had, that's great. I mean, I immediately went to queue to find out whether that was true. It wasn't quite true. It was a different briefcase, but there we go. I mean, <laughs> but what I'm saying is somebody who felt a burning desire to say, uh, look, this isn't quite what you think it is, got the opportunity to do it, got me to investigate it and see whether it's true or not, and participated in what we were doing. And people are constantly now feeding us information, endless information. We've never had it before. We've had press releases and public relations stunts from commercial entities and the rest of it, but we haven't had people who know things, academics. We are generating relationships with universities that had never been there before. People are prepared to come down from the mountain and share the tablets of stone using these devices which now exist. They simply didn't exist before. And this is the joy of what we're up to. We just, the only slight difficulty is we have to try and monetize it. Somehow we have to make it pay. But, but the quality of the information that we're getting is better than it's ever been. Of course, there's also a fantastic amount of rubbish. That's a problem. I mean, still, I imagine pornography is still probably the main driver of the web. Who knows? It used to be. I suspect it probably still is. Uh, but the very fact that there's a lot of bad appleery there doesn't mean that we aren't also getting an absolutely sensational um, uh, possibility. So I go back, finally, to the human being. I think everything's out there. We're all dressed up. We've got every, everything to play for. The human is the only issue. The human's got used to not going off and being particularly inquisitive and the rest of it. And somehow we have to get back to the point at which humans go out and don't just depend on everything that's coming in, but go out on our behalf to ferret about. And that's why I come back to Haiti. Haiti's a very interesting example of what is possible and what is not possible. Wonderful thing, you arrive two days after the earthquake, harrowing, ghastly, but the amazing thing is your mobile phone works. You talk immediately to London and tell them what you're seeing. And the best thing, you suddenly find that you can't do what they normally do, which is to go around sharing pictures with other people, with other agencies and the rest of it, and London saying, oh, we're seeing a great picture here, we're gonna cut that in, no. Because the thing is such a nightmare and it's so difficult to actually transmit material uh, from the ground. The mobile phone may work, but the, the dish and all the rest of it is complicated and there's a queue of people trying to get on and you've got very little time. And so you can only be as good as what you get yourself. No longer are you polluted by somebody in London saying they've seen a wonderful picture which they want you to use. You just use what you've got. And so you go out and you go and you, you go with the swim. And I went uh, on one occasion immediately after the earthquake and I was stopped in the street by a woman who said, you've got to come and see what's happened to us. You've got to come with us. And I said, no, I mean, what's happened to you is what's happened to everybody. And I, no, she said, you've got to come. So I went. And it was a little middle class area. We'd really only been in the working class areas, but the middle class areas were obviously very badly hit too. And, and that moment that she got me to her house, which had become a collapsed sandwich and her children were in there, uh, her father had died in it. A man comes up to me, because everybody in Haiti talks to you in Creole or French, uh, and, and that's fine, but the problem is that people in Britain won't put up with French for very long without it being translated. Uh, a man comes up to me and starts speaking to me in the most lyrical English. And this is because I went out. And he was a UN translator. And, you know, UN translators lost their houses too. And he had a pregnant wife, nine months pregnant. And he said, how am I going to, how, she's due any minute now. There are no midwives, there's no access to a hospital. How am I going to deliver the baby? And uh, I said, I have no idea. But, but he gave this most incredible interview. And, and he took us to his house, and there was his washing machine underneath the bottom floor. And, and it, you know, suddenly it all meant something. We could share it because the life he lived was the life we live. It, it depended on the same technology that we depend upon, the same sort of apparatus. And there they were, smashed and broken. And... Uh, it was, it, it was intensely moving because it was in our language, and that's a terribly kind of imperialist kind of thing to say, but it was. It was very, very accessible. And then, 10 days ago, I was in Washington doing the midterm elections, and my office said there's a hurricane coming, Hurricane Tuma, and it's got the Haiti right in the path, 
go. And I went, because I'd always wanted to go back and find out what happened to him and what happened to all the other people, How, what happened to the baby. And I went back, and we found more or less everybody we had found before, because we found the key places we had been to, and they were still there. Nothing had changed. I mean, they'd got a bit more shelter, but no houses had been built. And we found uh, that everybody we had spoken to except one had survived. The pastor that we had seen terribly badly injured by the collapse of his own church uh, had died. A woman who had got a huge, vast, horrible, infected wound to her face across her eye, had lost the eye, but was fit and well. And we were able to do something. It wasn't news in the sense of the hurricane has hit, the place is flooded. Um, it was, and, and that was part of it. But it, was, it filled in people's understanding of what is happening there because we were able to spend time unpolluted by live transmissions and the rest of it, unpolluted by having to share material with different people and the rest of it. No sausage machine television. Every correspondent that went to Haiti did wonderful stuff because they were cast out on their own. They just had to do whatever they could and then put it together and send it. And that's all they could do. Uh, and uh, it, that's what we've got to retrieve, is the human being in the field, the human being uh, experiencing what's going on and sharing it with the viewer, not sitting in some edit suite on a laptop, uh, simply pulling together a whole lot of pictures and saying, hey, this is what's going on. I'm not actually going to reveal that I'm sitting in a street in London. Um, you can kid yourself that I'm actually in Haiti, but you know, you've got to be in Haiti, and that costs. But if we can get the money from the other tower, we'll be able to spend it again. And when we spend it again, we'll have to be very good. Thank you very much. wonderful lecture. Um, there's time for questions. If I can make two requests. Posing a question, uh, could you s start by stating who you are and could you try to keep them relatively brief? So we have a question there. Thank you. Tim McGuire. Um, 60,000 people signed a petition handed in to prevent Murdoch buying over the rest of B Sky B. Does it matter? Will it stop him? What do you think? Well, um, my problem with Murdoch, really, in a sense, is that I think um, possession has brought him influence without perhaps our knowing it. Uh, we can guess it. But, but we, we have a kind of a side in which we describe Murdoch as the 24th member of the British Cabinet. Because really, for about 15 years, he's had absolutely untrammeled access to number 10. And even now with Cameron, almost the first visitor across his threshold was him. Two weekends ago, James Murdoch was at Chequers. Um, now, these things are in the public domain, and people can add up things for themselves, but they do have a very, very strong hold right now. And um, I don't think it's a good idea to have a disproportionate amount of media power in the hands of one entity, um, particularly when the entity is offshore and doesn't pay tax here. I mean, I must say, I feel very strongly that in these straitened times, if people want to exert influence in this country, they should pay taxes. We have a question here, please. Thank you. My name is Francesco Zhukovska. I have a question related to um, the difference between being in the comfort of the studio and being on the ground. Mm -hmm. um, Prior to, or after Hurricane Katrina hit New Orleans, when you were reporting in the studio, you made a comment to the effect that the United States had somehow brought Hurricane Katrina and all the devastation upon itself. Um, your tone when you were in New Orleans reporting from the ground was very different. And I wondered whether there had been any response to the comments that you made in the studio uh, and what your reaction was once you saw the devastation? 
Um, I think the, 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 the causes were often described as um, a consequence of uh, global warming. Um, so well, I suppose we all brought it on ourselves. So I, I, I don't actually remember that bit, but I certainly remember being on the ground in, um, in, in, in New Orleans. And um, it was a completely shattering experience. I mean, what was particularly shattering was that the United States didn't respond to it. I mean, the establishment didn't respond to it. So I arrived there 36 hours after it happened. We flew to Houston, and when we got to Houston, we used the yellow pages to find a flat-bottomed, fan-driven boat from the Florida Everglades. Uh, we found a man in the yellow pages who said he was prepared to drive to New Orleans. And actually, our journey from Houston and his from uh, uh, the Everglades, we got there at the same time. And we had a boat. And we thought, fine, on the first day we were there, we'll go out and we'll film. But we discovered we were almost the only people with a boat. I mean, there were no boats. New Orleans, no boats. It was an absolutely extraordinary situation. And of course, what happened was, every time we got anywhere near a building, people called out, cried out to us and said, I mean, there were people with terribly sick people, there were injured people. And uh, the, uh, you know, at that point, you're kind of reporting um, uh, responsibilities fade away in the interests of having to bring some sort of relief. And we were carting people into the boat while the cameraman was trying to avoid showing us doing it because it looked, you know, thoroughly kind of indulgent in a funny way. What were you doing shifting people into the boat? Why did you get on and tell us what's going on? But you couldn't. So uh, the, the situation was so bad that, that we were going around rescuing people. Uh, and unwillingly. I mean, I don't mean that. Of course, I was willingly doing it, but, but unwillingly because we shouldn't have been doing it. Somebody should have been there rescuing people. Um, and we were taking them to the motorway slipways, and then the helicopters were coming and taking them away. That bit was working. But FEMA, or whatever it's called, uh, just didn't respond for the first two or three days. And it was a very, very shocking experience. And of course, the thing was, the victims were all black. And that didn't feel comfortable either. Got a question there, please. Anne Packard, you are clearly in favor of Facebook and Twitter and all the modern media. Could I ask you, though, what your observations are on the issues of copyright, IP, and privacy, which may be infringed, and who and how they may be dealt with? Because there are many lawyers in this city who are actively protecting, for example, brand issues on behalf of clients and, and, mm. and achieving injunctions in court. And it, it seems to me it's only a problem which will expand. Well, um, it's a really interesting question. I, I was at our lunchtime workshop. I was talking about Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee, basically, I think we can credit with being the man um, who simply said, I'm not going to become a multi-billionaire. I want the world to have this and to have it for free. And I can't see, in the end, how you will ever uh, uh, roll that back. The web, I think, will always be an essentially free arena. The question then is, how do you protect um, people who stand to make huge losses from their own work and inventions, which, which would otherwise sustain their livelihoods and the rest of it? And very gradually, you can see there is a, there is a dialogue going on. Look at music. I mean, the fact is that, that some progress has been made towards enabling artists to get some comeback from material appearing on iTunes, etc., cetera. Um, it's, we're not there yet. And it's obviously, it's an anarchic thing, the World Wide Web, there's no question. Uh, but it, it can't be beyond the wit of man to find a way through it. And in many ways, the academics and the intellectuals whose property is being stolen, it's not very different from YouTube stealing our pictures. I mean, they're not stealing them, but I mean, they're having them for nothing. Uh, I mean, I like stuff pitching up on, um, on, on, on YouTube. I did an, an interview with a, 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 an interesting conservative MP called Zach Goldsmith, uh, which went a little bit awry because he kind of came in to take the studio over. And, and it makes great viewing on YouTube, and it's had lots of hits, and I'm very pleased about that. But we didn't get a single penny for any of them. Not one of those hits generated anything. So we're all in it. Uh, and, and, and of course, the lawyers are having a field day. 
Uh, I suspect the poor academics are the poorer for having hired the lawyers than they are for whatever was stolen on, on YouTube. But uh, that's a flippant observation. You raise a very serious problem, and I don't know what the answer to it is, but it can't be beyond our wit to find an answer, because if, if we don't find an answer, uh, we'll all end up in the poorhouse. Very good. There's a question over there. John, David Banks. Um, you've got a very clear view of the future, possibly optimistic view of the future for, um, for, for television in conjunction with new media, but medium feeds off This the is medium. the great David Banks of the Daily Mirror, now UK Press Gazette. Yeah, something like that. My yeah. God! <laughs> this, this guy is a towering inferno of a journalist of, of an earlier age, but still with this age. <laughs> this is amazing. What are you doing here, anyway? <laughs> Like everyone I else, I'm very much enjoying here. your performance, John. I, I thought I was in safe company. <laughs> <laughs> medium feeds off medium. Um, you've, you've satisfied us, I think, to some extent, that there is a future for television and new media. What about the oldest form of media, the printed word? Well, first of all, I mean, who's read the printed word on iPads? I mean, fantastic, better than the printed word, frankly. I mean, it's, it, a newspaper reading on an iPad is absolutely fantastic. Um, so I think the printed word per se uh, will survive. The issue is, will it survive on paper? Well, I can't see how it possibly can. I mean, I think books will survive because I think books have an added, added dimension. They have this three-dimensional thing and this precious thing that you want to own and keep forever as, the, as you read it. And, and um, there is something about reading a book. I mean, maybe we're all very old-fashioned. It'll die when we do. But, but uh, the newspaper, I think, is in trouble, I have to say, because I think uh, there's a man cutting the tree down. There's another one putting it into the pulp machine. There's somebody else spinning the paper. Uh, now, we haven't even got to the printed word yet. Then there's the people setting the printed word. Then, you know, it's a very expensive thing to produce one newspaper for one person. And it's hard to think that that's going to be an intelligent expenditure when your iPad is going to pick it up just like that without anybody cutting any tree down, anybody setting anything in that sense. Um, so I would give the paper 25 years. But I probably being up. What? Well, no, because you're online now. You're online, and you'll be much more online. And you see, when, when, when people become much more selective, that you will be in, well, you already are in their bookmarks and the rest of it. David Banks, what's he think? Christ, he used to edit the Daily Mirror. Very good, we've got a question here. Hi, my name is, uh, I'm a, a master's student for uh, global sociology. Um, that sounds interesting. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm a bit skeptical about your uh, optimism. Uh, about the I thought you age. might be. <laughs> <laughs> about the golden age of journalism. And uh, not so much because of the medium, but because of the audience viewing that medium. Um, I wonder what your opinion is about the, a the ADD attention span of the world that you are now having to deal with. And also, uh, since you were there with, for the midterm elections, um, the astroturf uh, social movements that are being generated by, uh, you know, Murdoch and the lot from Fox News. You know, uh, I'd be curious to hear your opinion. Well, I mean, you know, the, 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 the Fox News thing is, is absolutely fascinating because, as you know, three key players in the Tea Party are actually full-time employees of Fox News, yeah. uh, which is a staggering thing. That is, you know, for example, I would go out in some way and become the great sort of totem for um, veganism or something. I mean, it's a completely mad concept that somebody who says, you know, here's the news, by the way, I'm part of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, may I make the sign of the cross or something? You know, I mean, it's absolutely fabulous. Incredible, incredible. Uh, it's amazing that a sophisticated society can tolerate this. It's extraordinary crossover. I mean, cross-dressing, everything, everything, amazing. So, you know, that, I mean, that's something American. I mean, it, I don't think it's going to happen. That's something not going to happen here, I think. But, but the audience attention span, they do get to the end of Susan Boyle's song, and that's four, four minutes, 12 seconds. <laughs> and if, if they can do Susan Boyle, they can sure as hell do me. There you go. <laughs> Hi, um, Hannah Ewan. 
Um, I was just wondering... This is one persistent woman. I gave her an interview earlier today. <laughs> I remembered something that I didn't ask earlier. <laughs> I was just wondering how far you think the media might be complicit in the problems of monetizing the online by not charging for the content and whether you think the Times Online is the way to go by charging for it. No, I don't think the Times Online is, is the way to go, to be honest. I mean, the, the readership has plummeted despite the very nice spin they put on it. Um, you know, uh, I, I, I don't think that... I'll admit I pay for the FT uh, online, and I pay for the FT online because I'm a complete economic ignoramus, and we're living in economically unbelievably challenging times, trying to make sense of the Irish thing and the rest of it, and the FT is just terrific for that. Uh, so I do pay for that. But I would not pay for um, uh, the Times online simply because there are other offerings which may not be either as good or, or whatever, but I can get by with them. Um, I don't know what it is. I feel... I feel it's so stupid, isn't it? I want people to pay for me online. Well, why the hell wouldn't I pay for the Times? There, there's some hypocrisy there. I shall, I shall go and see somebody and sort myself out. <laughs> Very good. And I think there's a question over here, yes. Thank you, and thank you very much indeed for your masterclass this morning. I'm one of the undergraduate students on the course. I'm just following on from what you've just said in terms of monetizing good quality content, and the fact that you, as someone who does consume good quality content and provides it, isn't prepared to pay for it. I don't quite understand how you propose the future. I can't think of a single good quality media outlet that does charge. The BBC is funded entirely separately, all ITV news is funded from central government, there is, newspapers are dying, there, are no, there is no form of good quality content that people are prepared to pay for. And in that sense, how do you see it progressing? Well, as you've seen, I'm not interested in paying for it either, although I do pay for it on the FT because of the peculiar circumstances in which we live. But, I mean, as soon as the economic crisis is over, I'm dumping the, VT, the FT. But, <laughs> but in all sincerity, I'm not asking the people to pay for the content. I'm asking, you know, Google and all the rest of them to pay uh, some charge. I mean, certainly YouTube, um, even if it's a halfpenny. Um, and now how they get that money, I don't know. I think they get it from advertising. I mean, they must be making a killing on it. Well, in fact, there is no such thing as a, a currently a, a serious loss-making um, venture when it comes to Facebook, Twitter, and, uh, and, and the rest. So I'm presuming they will make it on advertising, just as everybody who's ever sold things before will make it on. Uh, but I think, I do not believe that people will have to pay for what I do. But I think that the people who carry it, who purvey it, will have to pay. But how, how? I don't know. I mean, you've asked me a question I can't answer. But it'll happen in our lifetime, well, my lifetime, and it'll be shorter than yours, so it'll happen in my lifetime. Very good, and we've got a question here. Hi, uh, my name is... Um, can you hear me? Oh, yeah, okay. very well. Uh, I just had a, a question. You um, talked about the, the, the potential of new media collaborating with the traditional media outlets, and um, there's this, one of the issues that may arise is uh, uh, citizens and consumers uh, searching after news stories that really cater to their, say, political ideologies and things like that. I was wondering if you had any um, sort of opinion or if you could say anything about that, because it seems to me like it could be a potential problem for the, you know, uh, talking about the golden age of, of, of journalism. I, I've always worried that, that, that we will become very myopic, that, that um, people will only want to read about football and the X Factor. Um, but actually, human beings are more inquisitive than that. And, and I think that the, the issue is that things happen. They hear word of it somehow, and they think, I wonder what that actually is. I, I just refuse to, sh to believe that human beings are going to shut down on their inquisitiveness. Um, you know, the fact is, take the royal wedding, for example. I mean, for some reason, people want to know a lot about this relationship. Why did they break up? You know, why did they get back together again? Why are they getting married? Why did you do it in Kenya? I, 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 I don't know. I'm not particularly interested in myself, but, but people are very, very interested. And if they're very, very interested in that, um, somehow I think they'll be interested in things. You know, you could say, nobody's going to read about global warming because they'll make sure it's not on their bookmark. It's not own, nowhere near their thing. But, you know, I think that if you live in Boscastle or somewhere and you see the water coming up, you think, I wonder if I ought to know about this. I think we've got a question here, and I'm afraid that will be the last one that we can take, I think. Hi, I'm Hilary Gustafson, and I was wondering if 
you think that the 24-hour news cycle has had a detrimental impact on the quality of journalism reporting on, for example, television or online? Mm, very, very interesting question. I think that the, um, the, the interesting thing about 24-hour news is that actually very few people watch it. That's interesting. <laughs> no, 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 and this is actually true. Um, uh, when we're on at, uh, at 7, um, Sky has often got an almost unmeasurably low, maybe 27,000, something like that, and we would have somewhere around 900,000 a million. Uh, and so, um, but the problem is it's a very creamy audience. There are MPs, ministers, people down the city, whatever. So it, it, they're opinion makers, then, and the worst thing is there are other hacks, other editors. And it has to be said that it is very destructive in the sense that when you're sitting at your desk, as I often do, I have the BBC on and Sky on all day, you can get to 7 o'clock and think, oh, that happened at midday. They'll be very bored to see it now at 7 o'clock. Of course, people coming in at 7 o'clock haven't seen any of it. And so that, to that extent, and it does also affect the agenda. But I think you have to rise above it. You have to rise above it. But it, it, I think it does it, and it also panics, I think, politicians into doing things before they're ready to do them. You know, they, they have to commit themselves now. Uh, and and um, I think it's a question of people managing it. Good. So my, my great privilege uh, to, to propose a vote of thanks. This has been an absolutely wonderful uh, conclusion to the wonderful uh, series on our changing world. Um, John, John set himself a really ambitious task, uh, which, to look, is to, which is to look at the interaction between the way technology of different types, but particularly communication technology and information technology, it has been interacting with the media over the last 50 years. A very, very hard task. Uh, and he showed tremendous journalistic gifts uh, with the, the clarity and the simplicity with which he expressed himself. I thought the, the level of analysis uh, was wonderful. I, the honesty and the humor were, were just tremendous. Uh, from my particular personal point of view, there were two things uh, that I found very attractive uh, in the lecture. One, despite all this daft laddie stuff, actually John showed himself to be really technologically savvy. And I can say, if I was <clears throat> marking you as a first year computer science student, you clearly understood the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. You, uh, you understood the difference between storage and bandwidth. And it was, there was, no, there was a real, real high level of, which is not always the case um, in, in, in prominent people, but there was a high level of technological understanding. And the other thing is you displayed a personal value, which is probably quite important in your job. In my job, it is absolutely vital. Uh, which is compulsive optimism, um, you know, you, you, uh, and, I don't, but I, and I thought the combination of technology, savviness, and optimism was really very, very admirable. But I think the most important thing for us, and it came through in the anecdotes in all sorts of ways, um, but it came through very, very clearly, and I'm sure it is, is the reason why you have such a, uh, a committed following as a journalist, is the humanity and the passion to me were just completely evident. Uh, so please join with me in thanking John. Thank you very much. This production is copyright, the University of Edinburgh.